respect is the minutes to decide. Let me tell the whole world. All right, tell me why you did with that. Beast, chump, punk, slump, you know what I'm saying? have a chance to come here and rebuttal today. No, they won't. They better come now. Check this out. They fired me, but did it in a roundabout punk snitch way. So I caught them on the streets and beat they behind. You know what I'm saying? Okay, like, I was guys, a nigga to the east, brother. And it ain't over. I still got more than <laughs> chunks. Don't jump to the TV. 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 Chuck Shakur is free on bail tonight after his indictment and the sexual assault on one of his fans. Rosemary Gomez cut off with Shakur in court, spewing his gangster rap for the cameras. Back the f up. Back the f up. Hurling a string of obscenities, rap star Tupac Shakur and members of his entourage were indicted on charges of weapons possession, sodomy, and sexual abuse. A young woman claimed she was sexually attacked by Shakur and some of his sidekicks at this Midtown hotel. But lawyers for the L.A.-based rapper blamed the victim, claiming she was so enamored by the rap star's persona, she sent him phone messages thanking him for oral sex. Rap star Tupac Shakur is in a hospital recovering from serious gunshot wounds as a New York jury deliberates his faith regarding sexual abuse charges. Police say Shakur was the victim of a robbery, and though the wounds were serious, he has been conscious and able to talk to his mother on the phone. Mark Shear has more. Police say controversial rap star Tupac Shakur was entering the street-level lobby of an eighth-floor recording studio near New York's Times Square after midnight when three robbers confronted him and his friends. Could you imagine yourself growing up knowing that your parents were a part of the Black Panther movement? Could you imagine yourself being so gifted at a young age and having so much knowledge instilled in you? Could you imagine yourself growing up and having dreams and aspirations of becoming a major music and movie star? And with all your hard work and dedication, you make those dreams come true. But it's like once the fame and the spotlight, it gets on you, you're starting to feel like you're being targeted. Even expressing within your lyrics, quote, life is a celebrity, it ain't everything, they make it. But somehow you still deal with it, you still push through. Throughout the arrests, the media bashing, the finger pointing, the negativity, the stress, the lies that's being splattered all on your name. It's got your mind in this twisted cycle. And you feel like you're, you feel like you probably not even going to make it through. So what do you do? You channel all that, that anger, that aggression, that emotion into your music, into your lyrics and expressing how you feel on that microphone. Because with everything that you're feeling, you're feeling like this could be your last album. This could be your last body of work. This could be the end. The reason why you feel like that, because you feel like it's just you against the world.
by producers Tony Pizarro and Gio Rose, where they would use audio from the news reports from the events that had taken place in Pac's life over the last couple of years, where they would talk about the uh, shooting that uh, happened at Quad Studios, the reports of him checking himself out the hospital 24 hours after being shot, uh, the case as far as the uh, sexual assault, and um, also they was talking about the reports of Pop being cleared on the charges of shooting two undercover Atlanta police officers. And uh, they also was talking about how Pop feared for his life while being in that hospital. That's the reason why he checked himself out because he didn't trust the doctors knowing that he was a uh, baby Black Panther. And he felt like they was targeting him or whatever. So that's the, that was his whole reason. Pussy and papers, poetry, power and pistols Plotting on murdering motherfuckers before they get you Picturing pitiful, punk niggas coughing, please Buffing weed as I position myself to clock G's Alright, now as you can see, this cut right here If I Die Tonight was produced by the great Easy Mo B who, produ who produced some few other records on this album Which we're gonna get into Now the samples that were found within If I Die Tonight were uh, Tonight, DJ Quick which was released in 1991. If you play your cards right, by Alicia Myers, which was released in 1981. Uh, Dre and Snoop, 1992, the cover, and we're no exception. Johnny Guitar Watson, which was released in 1976. Though. I'm gonna best describe his um his energy at that time as as nervous. Not in a bad way, just like he was a bundle of energy, man. And he had so much to get done at the same time while so much was going on. For instance, when we was in the studio recording all that stuff, he was going to the studio by, by night. But during the day, he was going to court. And we had the studio set for six o'clock every day i'll never forget it and as much as he was going through not a single day was he ever late six o'clock on the dot he bust through that door he was like moby yo let's get started um he's giving everybody their roles to do he's telling the engineer telling me Rappers that's supposed to get on the song like, yo, you make sure you know you're gonna do this second verse then. And yo, bring that other tape back up from yesterday. I wanna go back and finish my third verse. I want matter of fact I wanna change that. And then I'm gonna have you, you gonna come in. I used to be like, yo, you had to keep up with him, man. He was a bundle of energy, man. Now with the note three's verses on if I die tonight, Pop gets his shit off how he feel if he die tonight. Uh, you can feel the rage and the passion in all three of those verses being recorded. And not to mention, like how he was just, you know, flowing with the words and like with all the P's and stuff like that. And you know, this was just the beginning of the album. You know, you go back and listen to those verses, man. Like I played the clip of how he started the first verse off. It just it's just, you know. And you know what I'm saying typical pop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Soul Shark and Carlin. Now, if you're not aware of who these gentlemen are, then you might want to do yourself a favor and do your research. These guys hail from uh, Denmark, and you know they're responsible for some of the biggest hip hop and R&B records. Uh, singles like Before You Walk Out of My Life by Monica, Heartbreak Hotel by Whitney Houston, uh, Tony Braxton, I Love Me Some Him. They will also do work for Pac after he died. They did the original I Wonder If Heaven Got a Ghetto, uh, which they end up, you know, producing later on for us, like putting on another record. And they will end up doing uh, Do For Love as well. So, but... Uh, in a recent in interview, Soul Shock would break down how they end up 
you know, linking with Pac and how they end up, you know, you know, producing the work that they did on Me Against the World. Check it out. When, uh, and I kept just saying, um, can you please just keep feeding these hip hop tracks? Right. And that's, you know, and I send it to Tupac and I'm like, yeah, okay. You know, so optimistic. <laughs> and we got a call back and, and he said, Pac likes three of the tracks and he wants to record. And I'm driving on the street in LA. I'm just like, wait, what did you say? <laughs> yeah, you got to go now. And everybody's, I don't know. It's like the studio is a little bit in the hood and whatever. And I'm like, okay, do me a favor. Can you call the management and just let them know we're two white boys? Like, let's just get over it. Like, if it's an issue, it's okay. I get it. Like, but I just don't want to go down there. I got scared. <laughs> You know, we're still from Denmark, so, you know, we weren't really like, you know, so when they got a little bit rowdy, it was like, whoa, shit, you know, we're not really used to that. Um, so I just wanted to get out of the way, so I didn't go all the way down to Compton and then I like, had an issue. <laughs> so I'm driving and I got a phone call and it's Pac calling me. Mm-hmm. And I pick up the phone and he goes, I know who the fuck you are, motherfucker. And I'm like, okay, uh, you know, sorry, you know, I'm just 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 ready to get it and like and he goes i used to carry your fucking turntables i said what are you talking about i said who do you think put out your fucking turntables when you're out performing so we did a lot of shows but digital underground mm-hmm. okay. and um he was a roadie for digital underground oh. yeah so he actually at one point had set up my turntables for a show but we did the next then, thing we did you know was me against the world yeah, and uh, we he wanted to have some singing, and I was dating this girl called Puff Johnson at that time, yeah. um, and she was signed to Sony, and um, she ended up doing the hook, and uh, and he called me like two days after, and he goes, "Yo, guess what?" He goes, "That track is going to be the title track of my album." Wow, and I'm like, almost crying. <laughs> I mean, just just coming from a small city in Denmark, you know, very small working class city called Olborg. And and to end up and say to have the title for a Tupac record, you know, was just it's very hard to describe. It was um overwhelming, beautiful. So with all the sex distressing, the question I wonder is after death, after my last breath, when will I finally get to rest through this suppression? They punish the Zest. Still from the ones without possessions, the message I stress To make it stop, study your lessons, don't settle for less Even the genius asks us questions, be grateful for blessings Don't ever change, keep your essence The power is in the people and politics we address Always do your best, don't let the pressure make you panic And when you get stranded and things don't go the way you planned it Dreaming of riches, in a position of making a difference Politicians are hypocrites, they don't wanna listen If I'm insane, it's the fame made a brother change It wasn't nothing like the game, it's just me against the world Now, so many tears will end up being produced by Tupac's longtime friend, Shock G of Digital Underground. And one of the samples that was found inside this record came from Stevie Wonder's single, That Girl. And for those who don't know, Shock G was responsible for bringing Tupac into Digital Underground and introducing him to the world. You know, Pac started off as a roadie, then worked his way up into being in the group and now, you know, making his appearances on albums. And that's how he fought. Like, got his start musically, you know, to get his big break, to get his deal with Interscope and uh, the Tupac Lives Now album and so on and so forth. Now, So Many Tears, it would end up peaking uh, number six on the rap singles charts. And it was a very big record. And So Many Tears was a record that was very relatable not only to individuals in the streets, but individuals who just live everyday life. Because especially during the 90s, you know, there were a lot of deaths happening, whether it was gun violence, uh, what if it's like illnesses, you know, just like it is today. And so many people, you know, felt that record and felt it was relatable because you you shed so many tears after every time you turn around, you're losing a loved one, you're losing a best friend, you're losing someone that's close to you, and you get so tired of sharing so many tears, and you start to think like, damn, am I next? And that's what Pac expressing in his verses in this, and you know, this, it was a common thing within this album, you know, uh, talking about his depth and things like that, and Pac had always said that he wasn't going to live, you know, past the age of 24, 25. He, he constantly said that. And, you know, and like I said, death was a very common thing within his album, man. But it's still a classic song. Shit, so many tears.
Come here. Tell me, baby, are you lonely? Don't want to rush, I can help you if you only. Let me touch it from wrong, love, tell me. Cause I get caught up in the life I live as hell, see. I never thought I'd see the day when I would calm down. You ain't heard, I've been on the clown and get around. That's my word, see, you're walking and you're looking good. Yes, indeed, got a body like a sex fiend. Now, this will end up being the last single release uh, for the album. And this is like, this was released like a month before Pac would end up getting out of jail and the whole death row thing would take place. But this is a, this beat, if you go just listen to the instrumental alone, man, this is like one of the dopest beats ever, man. Shout out to Easy Mo B, one of the greatest producers ever. And uh, it was the samples that were found inside of this beat. Uh, it was from the Computer Love song, which was released in uh, 1985, 86. And also, uh, Watching Nuggets, uh, Red Man and Eric Sermon, which was on Red Man's first album, What the Album. And like I said, this is this that beat, man. That beat, and then just how everything came about and how they end up recording this song because it was originally recorded in 93 uh they end up remixing it and doing it over in 94 uh when they started this album and you know it was basically like a romantic joint you know one of the romantic joints for Pac. you know he had another one on there where we're gonna get into but and if you ever uh never had a chance to watch the video the way they put the video together was so clever because the simple fact that Pac was incarcerated at the time during the you know, shoot another video, of course, and just go look it up. You know, Tupac Temptations video, you're going to love it. I used to love watching that video as a young child growing up in the 90s, man. And just that beat along and just that song, man, it's a very, very great song, man, for real. Got this opportunity. You see, he know what I'm talking about. He got this opportunity to work with Tupac. How did that come about, you know? Well, it was... uh. I didn't know if it was a guy. going through beats to see what song he wanted to do off of the beat thing. And he uh -huh. he was like, it's this one. And he played and I was like, oh, you know what? That wasn't supposed to be on there, man. That was like, that's an R&B track that I had sold to this other kid, but uh -huh. he he couldn't do nothing with it, so he gave it back. So he looked at me and said, well, it's a rap now, nigga. And I was like, okay, okay. Let's go. <laughs> Now, for those who don't know who uh, Mosey MD is, dude is a very, very legendary producer and will go on to create some of the biggest hits uh, in rap and R&B and other different genres as well, man. Dude has done a lot. 
you know, definitely done a lot. Even, even well, work with Morris today. He worked with all the legendary figures. And, you know, this record right here, Young Ninjas, you know, Pac talks about, you know, his upbringing, you know, whether it be in New York or whether if it's in his time in Baltimore or his time in the Bay Area, you know, Pac never shied away from talking about his experiences and his upbringing and his growing up. And, you know, a lot of people like to always bring up the negative stuff Pac rapped about. But this is one of like a slick positive record, you know, towards the young individuals, the young guys growing up in the uh, urban areas and, you know, who are in a rush to grow up or rush to get into the, the streets or rushing to get into gang life and just letting you know how it is and what are the pros and cons and what are the consequences of, of what happens when you get into it you know it's nothing good comes out of it and you know he just saying he talking about his young his memories growing up and he's just putting that message out there that's one thing i always loved and respect about Pac. you know everybody want to talk about you know that's all he ever talked about this and then like yeah but outside of him talking about this and that you also make sure he relay uh, uh relay messages within his records man for real now heavy in the game will feature richie rich and uh, Lady Levy, and they were in the And now this is a track where you get that real pop passion and that that dope storytelling. I mean, he does a lot within uh, as far as these records, but you can tell like this was like that rage Pac right there. And Pac expresses, you know, his feelings on how the Lord only knows how life is for a lot of uh, black individuals, you know, who had to suffer through so much far as dealing with the daily struggles of living in poverty. You know, dealing with violence, trying to survive, and you know, and it's only the only way Pac can do it, and the only way Pac can describe it. You know, and not to mention, I can remember growing up as a young child when this album uh, came out. My brother was the neighborhood barber, and he would, you know, have music blasting out of the house while our mom would be at work, and he cutting hair. And I can remember that song right there just blasting through the speakers and still ringing through my head to this day. Lord knows, Lord knows, Lord knows. And I remember, I can still remember the first line. I smoke a blunt to take the pain out. And if I wouldn't hire, I'd probably try to blow my brains out. I'm hopeless. And them two lines right there, so many rap rappers have used that line so many times in so many ways. And that lets you know like how influential Pac has been in a lot of music, you know, before his
like them. And a lot of people really just don't know how much goes into, you know, getting into the spotlight and maintaining that spotlight. And, you know, we we know now, you know, how it is and what people go through. And to be honest with you, once a lot of these celebrities get a taste of their fame and that spotlight and that lifestyle, whether if they, you know, admit it or not, a lot of them really wish that they can go back to a regular life. A lot of them wish that they can just go back to, you know, living normal like us. A lot of them do. And what Pac was just letting you know that with everything he was going through, it's not easy being here, but, you know, it's his life. And, you know, he's going to do what he have to do and continue to keep, keep living. Now, Can You Get Away samples Frankie Beverly and Maze's Happy Feelings. Happy feelings in the air. And it's basically Pac on his storytelling tip, and he's trying to uh, spend time with a young lady who was already involved in the relationship, but not a good relationship because she's obviously not happy. Uh, she's being abused. She's not being treated correctly, and Pac wants to take her out, you know, uh, take her away from the, uh, the madness for a little while. And uh, just, you know, treat her like the queen that he feel like she deserves. And even in the verse, he states that maybe I should find a woman of my own. But, you know, he wants her. And her name is Ebony Fires within the song. And, you know, it's a very it's great record. I wish they would have kind of went with a single for this. I think they would have. But, you know, well, I think they should have. But, you know, the album still was successful. But I love that record right there. And this is what I mean far as how sampling went back in the day because everybody knows that you know this is frankie beverly and Maze's song happy feelings but this is what a lot of uh you new school cats need to learn when you're sampling old school records learn like make sure it's a good record don't just be sampling just to be sampling if you're going to you know sample someone's music make sure it's a great creation just don't go in there and try to lay anything down on it man because you need to respect the art and respect like the artist that you're sampling because that shows the homage and that shows the real homage that you care about the music and the art Now, Old School is definitely a song that I've always loved to hear. And because I'm a hip-hop head, and just listen how Pac brags about all the old school pioneers who came before him and who paved the way so therefore he can have a presence within rap. You know, uh, he talks about Big Daddy Kane, De La Soul, and just just all the old school hip-hoppers. And you got to think, a lot of people forget Pac, is, he's a New Yorker. Like people, you know, understand he, he, he been he was living in Baltimore, you know he lived in Harlem, he lived on uh, he lived in the Bay Area, and he, uh, you know, what I'm saying he was repping L.A. But at the end of the day, you know, Pac is a true New Yorker, and look how he just expresses his his gratitude and his appreciation towards the old school. What more can I say? I wouldn't be here today if the old school didn't pay the way. And just, I can tell he can de he definitely had fun making this record because not only he talks about the individuals who he was listening to growing up, and he talks about his days growing, like, you know, being raised in New York as well. You know, the stuff he used to get into. And just go back to the end of that record. Once it ends, and he, how excited.
Off, which is the last record on the album. You know, I looked at it as a posse cut because they, you know, had the outlaws on there, which at the time they was going by a drum recital. And, you know, they made an appearance on this and on the title track, Man Against the World. And I think this is when Pac really started brand the whole name Outlaw because at first it was just, it was Thug Life. Um, far as, you know, the group and stuff like that, which it didn't really go too well. Even though the Thug Life album, Vibe One, that shit was jamming. That was bumping. If you never heard the Thug Life album, go back and check that out. It's, it's classic. But uh, I look at this as a posse cut. And one of the things I'm going to say is this. Man, people really need to stop acting like the Outlaws was trash. They were not trash. They held their own far as on records, like with Pac or whatever. Now, of course, it's hard for them to stay afloat when the main leader is Pac and he's no longer here. But when Pac was alive and all that stuff, yeah, like people really act like the Outlaws was just garbage or something, man. Them dudes held their own, you know. And there was a reason why Pac fucked with them. There's a reason why Pac rolled with them, you know. Them, those were his guys, you know. So, man, the Outlaws was not trash, in my opinion. There's a lot of crew, like, people who have crews and stuff. Got some trash people in their group. And, you know, I just feel like the Outlaws was definitely not that, man. People talking about, so all the Outlaws messed up songs with Pac. No, they did, man. No, the hell they did. I need to go back and listen to some of those verses. So, and really rethink your opinion. I mean, I'm just saying. Cause especially in today's music. <laughs> If anything, uh, compared to a lot of stuff today, the Outlaws are lyrical assassins, man. But, you know, I like the Outlaws. And not to mention, I found out that this beat right here, um, it was actually supposed to be an R&B song. And I can't, now that, you know, you listen to that song so many times, I can't hear it as an R&B track. <laughs> I cannot hear it as an R&B track for real, though. You know, from what Pac and, you know, the Outlaws did to this record and how they, like, you know, how they structured this record as, like, some old gangster shit, I cannot, I can't hear it as an R&B song. That's just crazy, though, man. I was like, damn, I was doing my research, like, this is supposed to be an R&B record, and Pac made it into a gangster shit. Only Pac, man. Only Pac. Man, it just, you know, it's just something about this album that, you know, I felt like, you know, Pac really put his all into this. And I know a lot of people say, you know, All Eyes On Me is his best album and it's one of his best selling albums. But it's just in my opinion, the story, the, the storytelling, the lyricism, um, just the passion and everything. And Pac always gonna have that passion within his music. But for this album, it's like he laid it all out on the line. Now, if you all want me to do a breakdown on All Eyes on Me, I can do that because that was his comeback album. And I felt like a lot of people kind of popped out and they didn't expect for him to come, you know, the way he did. So I can do a, a breakdown on that, but this will always be my favorite Pac album no matter what. You know, and I feel like this album deserves more credit and more shine than, you know, a lot of his other albums, in my opinion, you know. But, you know, this I'm always love this album, man. But I hope you all enjoyed this. And it just goes to show you how loved and impactful this man was. You got to think this man died in 1996. And here we are in 2024. And we're still talking about his, his music and his albums to this day. And I can only imagine what he'd be doing now if he was still alive, man. He's very missed. And they knew that Pop was very influential and very impactful, man. They knew. They knew the power that he had, and he knew the power that he had. And dude did so much just in very little time as far as music, entertainment, and just everything, man. I mean, he, he, he was, he's supposed to be here with us, man. He was supposed to be here for, with us, man. But... But let me know in the comments, man, what did you thought about, uh, you know, about this episode. And also, let me know what's your favorite, favorite Pac album, what's your favorite Pac song. You know, uh, when, was, when the first time you heard Pac, you know, when was your favorite Pac moment, you know. Just let me know in the comments. Uh, make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you're feeling generous, you can donate to, you know, the Super Chat. You know, keep the lights on here at the MN. So... But I'm um, about to wrap this up. Until next time, Fires on the Music Journey series. My name is Moss, and I'm out.
Thank you for your love and support.